Welcome to another of our special Magpie Circle one-on-one -on -one productions. Uh, we've had four or five plays this season and we're delighted to have another one today. Uh, and I think when it comes to Champions League appearances, domestic titles and world footballing records, our guest today is very much in a league of his own. Here's a few stats for you. 13 games in the Champions League, seven Welsh Premier titles with TNS, the New Saints, and here's one, a world record 27 consecutive victories in a domestic top flight European league. Notts County, of course, is most important today, and for the first time, Conal Rawlinson will be giving us a detailed insight into what it was like to go through Wembley heartache two successive playoff campaigns, axed from that fateful playoff campaign two years ago. In-depth thoughts too from Connell on our current National League campaign and what we will be judging as success and failure come the end of this season. Connell, delighted to have you, Pelt. Thank you ever so much for joining us. How you doing, mate? It's good to be on, mate, to be fair, yeah. Yeah, no, delighted. We had a quick catch up at the sponsors training session earlier this week. So uh, yeah. I was armed with, well, you gave me a few of those stats, didn't you? Um, yeah. yeah. I tell you what, let's um, let's talk Champions League on the basis we don't do it very often on the Magpie Circle, if I'm honest no, with you. Okay. Um, so the New Saints, um, 13 games in the Champions League. I'm not sure whether any of them were quite like, uh, we're, we're doing this interview um, the day after, uh, I guess we were all watching um, a quite incredible tie in Madrid between Atletico and Manchester City. Yeah. I'm not sure any were like that, but I bet you've got a few stories and tales to tell, haven't you? Oh, yeah. I, I saw, obviously, I was speaking to training the other day and that, and, you know, I've, I look back on that time playing in, Wel in Welsh football and it was it was really enjoyable, like you say, the, the trips away with, with the new Saints and that across Europe. You know, we had some big games against some big teams, you know, Anderlecht. Uh, Michelin, uh, I'm trying to rile them off my head now. CSK Sofia, Legia Warsaw, um, really, really decent sides on a European level, and uh, it was just a great time in my career. You know, really, really enjoyed it to be honest. What What, what was your first venture into Europe with TNS then? First one was we played Bohemians, which is an Irish side, um, and we beat them in the second qualifying round. And um, we actually lost one nil away, and uh, at the time, Paddy Madden was playing up front from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We lost one nil away, and then we come back, and obviously TNS they play on a plastic pitch, you know, like Brom, uh, like uh, Bromley do, and uh, they just couldn't get to grips with it, and we ended up beating them four nil at home, knowing we were going to get Anderlecht in the in the next round. So, you know, going there at that young age and being able to experience that. Uh, straight off the bat with them was 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 amazing. Like, you know, you went away to Anderlecht. There was, you know, they absolutely worshipped football out there. You know, Lukaku at the time was was just coming through and, you know, there was skyscrapers with him on the side of and all sorts in Belgium. So, you know, it was, uh, it was a great start to my career, actually, with, with the new Saints to be able to experience something like that. So, so how did you get on coming up marking Roma, uh, Romelo Lukaku? Yeah, well, he's, uh, like you say, I think even looking back then, when he played, uh, he was a unit straight away. Like he was like the same size as now when he was sixteen. It, it was crazy. Um, but yeah, he 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 come on in the away leg for about fifteen minutes, scored two goals, ran to the centre circle, did this mad dance. You've got twenty six thousand Belgians there all screaming his name. It was it was a, a great experience. Like I say, I look back at them times with really fond memories. To be honest with you. Yeah. Were you actually tasked with marking him for them two goals or not? Or was that no, I didn't. Properly? I didn't. Actually, I didn't actually play uh, away uh, the away leg. Um, so I was on the bench. I was only a young kid at the time. I was, uh, I think, I just turned eighteen. So, uh, like you say, to go in there and play against him would have been lovely. But just being involved in the in the day in the atmosphere, you know, we were armed police to the ground and stuff. You know, they were clearing all the cars out of the way. We were flying through. It was it was a hell of an experience, like for for flight safe from the age of eighteen. Um, you had plenty of other trips to some of the Eastern European teams you've mentioned as well. Sofia, yeah. Warsaw, I think you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Like you say, both. You know, the fans out there are just it's different levels. You know, it's it's like religion for them. 
Um, you know, they work and it's all about that that game on a Saturday for them. The fans in Legia Warsaw were the best I've I've ever seen. Do you know what I mean? Like they were unbelievable. Um, thousands of them there, flares going off. You know, you 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 me trying to speak to a right back in that kind of atmosphere, and all you can see is your lips moving. You can't even hear yourself talk. It's it was it was incredible, like you say, uh, and them countries, it's just like you say, it's religion for them. They they absolutely love it. Were those games um, almost like the highlight of the season for TNS? Then it was kind of like, who do we we win the league? Yeah, we have another one. Uh, who, who do we get? Where are we going? Yeah, yeah. Well, that was the whole thing. You know, we we would probably spend around. You'd have six weeks probably um, at the start of the season where you were doing the European qualifiers and and stuff like that. So, and then the season itself, you know, you've got to kind of bring yourself back to back to ground and think, right, let's get our heads on it now because we want another European campaign obviously next year round. But only way to achieve that was obviously to win the league. And uh, like obviously said before, we had a we had a very good team at the time and we went on to win seven successive titles on the bounce. Um when Were you I was full there. Time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, full time. Uh, at the time it was when I first signed, they had the likes of us that were full time. The Nephew were touching full time. Um Neath put a lot of money in it at one point. You know, they signed Lee Trundle and they had some good players there. They they went full time. So uh, it was quite a strong league. Bangor was always very strong side as well, but they were part time. Um, but yeah, like you say, it was good because obviously when I I was at Chester as a YT, and obviously the club went into liquidation. So I literally had had nothing. I was out of a job. You know, I, I was thought of quite highly there, and I was going to go and push into the first team. And I remember just sitting in a car park, uh, in a pub car park with my dad in the rain. And he was going, what are you going to do now, son? And I was like, I don't know. And he goes, well, why don't you give TNS a ring and see if you can go down there and stay in the game? And, you know, I did. I rang, rang him in a pub car park and said, any chance I could come down? And, and that's how it started. And it just went on from there, really. Are you a Wrexham lad originally? I was born in Wrexham, yeah. 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 But I, like you said, I ended up playing for Chester as a white too, like. Yeah, no, no, it was just with you mentioning about you and your dad in the car park because um, yeah. one of my good friends is from, from Wrexham. Uh, right. He claims to be uh, almost as famous in Wrexham as Ryan Reynolds. Oh, right. <laughs> Any clue? I'll get, uh, so, so he's a legend in his own lunchtime, born in Wrexham, right. supported Wrexham, played for Manchester United, youth oh. team. Yeah. And Alex Ferguson hauled him in one day at 18 and said, son, you're not good enough. You might come back to haunt me, but I'm going to release you. And he got in his car. And yeah. The point you were making there about your dad. Yeah. He was in a head-on crash half an hour after Fergie had cut him from Manchester United. Who do you reckon? Yeah, I wouldn't have a clue. I wouldn't have a clue. You, you, you'll kick yourself. You'll kick yourself. Like, Robbie Savage. Obvious? Robbie Savage. Wow, do you know what? I was going to say that then. I was going to, I had Robbie Savage on the end of my song, but I didn't want to make myself look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Robbie says, when, when you are cut at that age, yeah. don't matter whether yeah. it's Manchester United, Chester, uh, Chester, wherever, it's potentially, you feel like it's the end of the world, I guess. Oh, definitely. Like you say, um, I remember I got released at 16 from Everton. Um, I spent most of my, my young career from 10 to 16 there. Like, and, you know, it is heartbreaking. Um, but I think as you get older and you, you've been in the game a long time, I think you learn to deal with disappointment a lot better. You know how to handle it a lot better. You know, when you're a kid, you think everything's going perfect and, you know, you're going to make it and all this. And then when that stops, I think at that age, it's very, very tough to deal with. But as you get older and you mature, you learn to deal with failure, I think, a little bit better than what you do when you're, when you're a kid. So during your time at the New Saints, and, and for those that don't know, TNS, uh, it, it, they're based in Oswestry, yeah? Yeah, Oswestry, yeah. yeah. Um, so seven uh, domestic titles, but during yeah. one of these, or I don't know whether it, t tell us a bit more, it carried over, yeah. um, world record number of consecutive victories. And, and, yeah. and, and for the world record to be valid, it is to play in the top, league in your domestic country which clearly the Welsh Premier League is you got 27 yeah. on the bounce how many of them did you play 
Everyone, yeah, good. Yeah, I had a strong season that year, to be fair, as well. We had a really, really good team. Um, we had a good manager in, in charge as well, in Craig Harrison, um, who actually went and managed Hartlepool shortly after. Um, but yeah, it was, it was obviously you get to 10 games, then you get to 15, and you get to 20, and all of a sudden, you know, BBC Sports were getting involved and stuff, and you know, the, the pressure was on like, and uh, funnily enough, once we broke the record, which was 27 previously 26, the next game we lost. <laughs> it, honest to God, you couldn't write it. Um, but yeah, we, the, the club got uh, officially, obviously, a, a world record. Um, so we're, it's something that, you know, we were very proud of as a team when we achieved it and that. And it was, you know, I think we had the league wrapped up in February. You know, we were that dominant. And that year, it was just no one could get near us. And I think when we got it, I think the next game, there was that much relief that we could just be like, right, let's just relax now and you can chill out. And then we ended up losing 2-1 to uh, Newtown <laughs> the week after. Now, now one um, di- bit of a different era, but a name well known to many Knox fans, uh, Andy Legg. Now, he's quite yep. uh, well thought of, uh, and I think he managed Clenethley for a while, so you'd have come across him in his long throws, would you? Yeah, yeah. Well, when I first obviously signed with TNS, Clenethley were quite a dominant side in the division. And uh, he was still playing at the time. I think he played well into his 40s. He did, yeah. Um, absolute fit as a fiddle. Do you know yeah. what I mean? He was, and his throw was, he had a, like an absolute cannon on him. It flew in from the halfway line. Like you say, it, when you can get balls in the box from the halfway line, every time you can see the throw, it's like defending a corner. But um, but yeah, he was a really, really well-respected um, fellow within the, the Welsh game. And, you know, he had a lot of time for people and that, and he was just a nice, nice fella, do you know what I mean? And, you know, I obviously finding out he was obviously at Notts for a, a part of his career as well, like, so, uh, but yeah. it's not too far from back. Nottingham as well, one of the villages out on the east side, so he's still got yeah. some connections. Um, yeah, yeah. For, for, for all us Notts fans that haven't seen too much of the Welsh Premier League, yeah. Um, where would you categorise the standard, say, in relation to where we are now, the National League? Yeah, um, it's it's quite tough to be honest because you obviously have three or four teams that are quite dominant and are 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 good and you know could could play in our division at the minute and probably do okay. You know the top sides. You've got a bit of a mix of contrast as well because obviously the new Saints are very much total football, keep the ball on the ground, and you can flip it to the last two previous champions who was Connors Key. Um, are very direct. They get the ball forward quick. You know, they put the big lads up. So both of them teams would, for me, be able to compete in our division. Um, But like you say, I watched the Welsh Sea, England Sea game the other week. Mm. Uh, We spoke about it the other day. And I was pleasantly surprised with how well the Welsh lads did. Because that there, that game there is to showcase the talent in obviously the Welsh Welsh pyramid. And uh, so... You know, all these lads played for Barry and other teams like that. And to be obviously what a team, our England side was the best talent we had available to us at National League level. For them to obviously get beat 4-0, I think it goes to show that there is a lot of good players in, in that division. So, yeah, I think it, the top end lads are pretty similar to, to the standard we're playing now. Um, as you go further down the league, you know, you're probably maybe dropping into the Conference North. Conference South standard kind of thing, but but still a very good standard. And there's a lot of good good players in that division, and I think there's not enough scouts that go and have a look at that league because there's hidden gems in it. There really is, like you know, there's a lot of lads that have come from it. Scott Quigley, uh, Stockport uh, was at TNS for me for a while. Yeah. Sam Finley, um, who's now at Bristol Rovers. Craig Jones had a good move to Berry, played there for plenty of time. So there is there is hidden gems in there. Reese Healy's another one who's playing in Toulouse now, doing really well. So uh, I think, like you say, for, for, for scouting, you know, to go and have a look and see what's there, you know, you can fall across a diamond, like you say, you never know, really. Um, OK, so you've had a long time in Wales, mm-hmm. uh, Welsh yeah. football. You yeah. get back into English football with Port Vale, correct? For a couple of years. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, to be honest, I think I probably spent maybe a year or two too long in the, in the, Welsh, in the Welsh League. Um, I could have probably left a bit earlier. But obviously, I was under contract and there was a few teams that were, were sniffing around and were interested. But I was under contract and they wanted money for me. And it was kind of, they priced me out a bit, a little bit, to be honest. So I had to wait for my contract to run down before I could obviously leave on a free, which which then I signed for obviously Port Vale. 
And you clocked up quite a few. You didn't miss many at Port Vale, did you? You had two, yeah. I, would, I would guess, enjoyable seasons for you in the English, but, you know, playing yeah. regular in the English League other than a brief taste with Chester. Well, yeah, it, it was it was one of the things I wanted to go and test myself. And obviously when Port Vale came in and it was a move to the AFL, I thought, you know, I want to go and see if I can handle that standard. And, you know, I went in, I remember speaking to uh, Neil Aspen, who was the manager who signed me there. Um, great fella. Uh, got a lot of time for him. He gave me a chance to obviously play football league. And, and I remember when he signed me, I walked in, he went, look, there's the contract, lad. I'm giving you your chance. It's not going to change. If you want to sign it, sign it. Um, we're signing. They signed Leon Leg at the time. They had Nathan Smith there, and he was going. Look, I can't promise you'll play, but I believe in you. Show me that you're the best one we've got. So I just signed. I went away and I said, I'll bet you I'll be starting the first game for you in the first game of the season. Coming pre-season, did really well, and I ended up playing, I think, 32 games on the trot for them. And then obviously Neil Aspin got got sacked in. I think the late January, February, um, John Askey came in and um, it, it, we just we just clashed, I think. Um, and it just didn't go on from there. Like I had a bit of a, a loss in my family um, and he gave me a bit of time off. And when I came back, something just changed and I didn't play again for him then. Um, and it was just one of them things, I think. So I just kept myself fit, um, played in reserve games, uh, kept the right attitude. And I actually played knots in a reserve game at Ilkeston. And Coxie yeah. was there. And at the time, Lee Fowler was the manager at Ilkeston. And Coxie turned around to Lee Fowler, and I'm good pals with Lee. He's from around my end. Said, oh, yeah, he's class, lad. He's just, he's not, why is he not playing for Port Vale? He goes, oh, the, him and the manager have just had a bit of a disagreement and he's not in the fold at the minute. Coxie was like, well, but yeah, we'll have him. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's how it, and that's how it came about. We moved to knots. I, uh, I actually terminated my contract at Port Vale even though I had a year left on it I just said look I don't want any money I don't want to pay up you know not to count you're interested I want to go and pursue that um, and that was it that happened on the Monday and I signed that happened on the Saturday signed for knots on the Monday played on the Tuesday your first game so it was good yeah um, Port Vale obviously a decent sized club knots have just dropped yeah. out of the football league um, yeah um but nevertheless, I, I guess there is a big, to this day, weight of expectation when when Notts County are in the National League on being expected to win most games. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of the other clubs in this division treat coming to Meadow Lane, whatever, as their big cup final. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so how, how, how did you settle in under Neil? Yeah, I settled in really well. Um, like you said, I, I, I come in and, you know, Neil and Coxie were were really, really good with me. Do you know what I mean? They, they made it simple from what they wanted me to do. You know, go in there, be a leader, be commanding, um, win your edges. And uh, they made it very simple for me. Just say, go and do what you're good at. And uh, that first season was probably arguably one of the best seasons I've had personally, um, performance-wise. And, you know, the first season, I, I still say to this day, if the league wasn't cut short, mm -hmm. we'd have gone on to win that title that year. There was just a feel about the place, you know. We had the confidence within the squad. We were chasing battle down. We'd just gone and beat them at their place. Two nil up their place, yeah. Yeah, and they had to play Harrogate as well at some point. Uh, quickly had just been sent off in our game as well. He was going to miss oh. three games. And we were just we were just motoring at that point. So uh, it was a very enjoyable first season for me to come, like, when I came here. Um, you, you, you missed very few games. I don't know whether you'll appreciate these stats or not. I, I've got yeah. it... Um, 40 games, yeah. two goals, 3,323 yeah. minutes. Okay, so yeah. yeah, COVID's hit. Last game you would have played of the regular season before it shut down was Eastley, wasn't it? Where, where I think yeah. our claim to fame was it was the largest crowd in Western Europe that day. Yeah, yeah. well, I think it was the only football game like in the world that was playing that day. Yeah. That's why that it was time, the largest was crowd. In yeah, the world. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, honest to God, like I remember, we we're in the changing rooms and we were the only game playing on live score. There was no other games. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, a load of journalists rang me up and said, "Oh, what's going on? What you know?" Because they say everything else had shut down. We were allowed yeah. to play, and of course, we had a really big crowd for it. So, yeah, yeah. bold them up, um, and then you know we are now in it. We're now in lockdown. Um, yeah. If you think back to what happened, 
Yeah. What, what was that like as a professional? Did you carry on training? Were you confined <sighs> to barracks? What 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 what, what, what yeah, happened for was... a month or two before the season resumed? Because there was talk the season might not even resume, wasn't there? No one yeah, knew was, what was yeah. gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was it was a tough, tough time because obviously I don't think anyone had been through what we were going through at that time. And it was like such a shock to the system to obviously have something that you do every day just taken away. And I think obviously it made like well, it definitely made me appreciate the job a lot more because when you when you cut when you can't do it, you know, it's and it's taken away, you you feel it. And it was hard to, you know not knowing what was going on, where we coming back with, you know, they were talking about just cancelling all together. And I'm thinking we've put in 40, you know, 40 games a season, hard graph to get where we got. Surely they just can't turn around and just cancel on us. Do you know what I mean? Like they, they have to wait and try and get some sort of promotion. It's obviously like a playoff thing again. And they did in the end. And when we came back, you know, it was, it was hard. We had to train hard again. It was like a mini pre-season. Um, few lad like, developed knocks because you know you're coming back and you know you get tight I, I got a, I had a tight car uh for the Barnet game but yeah so and you know other lads were coming back and it, it was it was really difficult to be honest with you um and like you say but for me I, I that feeling of when we were on that run and we were going to chase down Barrow and that it was just it felt like we were robbed that's what I felt like anyway robbed of a chance of obviously getting promotion by uh, winning the league Okay, so you weren't quite hundred percent for Barnet. One, no, two nil if memory serves. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah. then we're at Wembley. Yeah? yeah, I don't know whether you played at Wembley before or not. Uh, no, that was my first time now. Yeah, um, so it's Harrogate. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure when the award was made, but I think certainly at some point you were made. I think joint or either outright player of the year. I think from the supporters club or whatever. Uh, yeah. So. What is that? Yeah, I'm trying to do it delicately. Uh, no, what, you've what, got you. What, what was that away, like to be kind of regular? Yeah, yeah. Well, you were yeah. regular, ninety minutes every week. Yeah, and then not to be starting at mm. Wembley. Just talk me through what happened. How did you find out? How did you feel? Yeah, well, um, obviously, the Barnet game, I think, led us a little bit. I think it was it hindered us in the final uh, of the Barnet game. Because for me, it was, we got an easier team in the semi-final. But I'd rather had a tougher team. So we were more ready to play Halligan, who were arguably, you know, the best team in the division that year. Um, so for me, obviously, you find out the news. I missed the Barnet game and you're thinking, oh, they've played well, we've won 2-0. He's probably not going to change it. But for me, I've always been able to deal with disappointment quite well. Um, I never let it. Get, get me down or stuff like that. You know, the day of the final, I was around the lads. I was speaking to them all, trying to rev us all. Uh, I remember speaking to, uh, I remember speaking to Turns before the game and Turns was like, like, I'm sorry, mate. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, you, you, if anyone in this change room deserves to be playing today, it's you. And uh, I said to him, I said, don't be stupid. I said, you don't have to say sorry. I said, just go out there and get us promoted. I said, that'll be enough for me. Um, but yeah, I think you, you've got to put your personal accolades and your personal problems to the side especially for games that big um i've always been able to deal with like disappointment of not playing or being left out or stuff like that so for me it was just about the team and you know i still enjoyed the occasion on the day being there the build up to it all um but like you say just wasn't to be for me that day um how did you find out you weren't starting or when did you find out um so you do a pre-match you have a pre-match meal normally um before you go to the ground and you'll have a meeting after you after your food, the team will go up, uh, bench will go up, and then we'll probably do a bit of tactics on them and a few video footage and stuff like that. So it would have been probably talking about an hour and a half, two hours before kickoff. Okay. So it was the day of the game, hours before yep. kickoff. So this wasn't mm -hmm. a case of the team being outlined on the last training session a day or two before. Um, no. Did you have any – were you – thinking oh, I might be back or probably won't start or I mean what's going through your mind when you wake up that morning yeah yeah I'm just I'm just thinking about the game and you know you, you think to yourself you know will he will I get back in you know they've, they've won 2-0 and I'm thinking oh, I don't know really you normally have a gut feeling in football you ask any footballer 
you know if you're playing. You have a gut feeling. You just know. I don't know how to explain it. Like, just the way training goes through the week and you kind of gelling and you can see how things want to, are going to be panning out towards the weekend. And I just didn't have that feeling that I was playing. But you always hope, don't you, you know, the team pops up and your name's on it and that. But it, it just wasn't, like you said, it just wasn't the team. And I just made sure that I forgot about the disappointment for that and just just cracked on with doing what I do in the change room, which is try and speak to lads, motivate lads, get lads raring to go. And that's just exactly what I did. So, and I'm sure it's, without wishing to labour the point, but I'm sure it's interesting to, to, to fans mm-hmm. to understand exactly how you find out, you know, those that play Sunday morning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. is it just like read out? Is there a notice put on a wall anywhere? I mean, yeah. But normally you have like, obviously, they'll have a laptop that's plugged into a big projector. And, you know, at the mo- at this moment in time, you just go, it just pops up on the screen. You know, you, you, there's your team and you're looking, you're trying to find your name and you think, right, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> or I'm not in. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think a lot, I think different managers that I do different things, to be honest with you. I think some people like being told on a Friday, managers like telling the team on a Friday, they can work on the team, you know, for set plays and stuff. Some like to name it on the day. Just think it's uh, one of them, really. It's just preference for a manager and, and what he wants to do. But whether you're left out on a Friday or a Saturday, it still feels the same. Um, there's a lot of debate and you're kind of damned if you do, mm-hmm. you're damned if you don't. But I've been, I would be interested in a player's perspective, particularly one that hadn't been to Wembley. So Harrogate made this into a big occasion. No, not, yeah. I, I, virtually all of their players hadn't played at Wembley before. They went down a couple of days before. I think they used Arsenal or Watford's training ground, stopped there a night or two, and mm-hmm. treated it as a whole occasion, although clearly there were no fans. Um, yeah. Neil went for going down on the morning of the game. So you drive to Madeleine, whatever it is, yeah. you get on the bus, and, and it's a normal away yeah. game. Yeah. What, what, what was your view? Um, like you say, uh, it's preference again, I think, for individual players. I quite enjoy uh, an away day stay over me, you know, a London trip, Torquay, something like that. I like to go away, I like to travel down the bus with the lads, have a bit of crack, uh, get down there, you have your dinner together, you're all chatting, have a nice relaxing night in the hotel. You get up in the morning, you're ready, your food's all ready, you're doing your pre-match and then you're starting to focus on the game. Uh, some lads don't like staying over. Some like, like lads like going on the day and travelling on the day. Um, but like you say, I think I think that what Neil was trying to do with us was I think he was trying to take out the expectation of what was at stake and didn't want to make it too big of a thing and take away what we'd normally do on a normal day in a normal game. Um, but I, I'll be honest with you, I don't think that would have had any, any change on anything anyway. Um, at the end of the day, whether you stay over or you travel on the day, you're still going to play a game of football. And I just think personally on that that day, we just didn't turn up. Yeah, and there's been so much debate about that one. Um, yeah. And clearly, it's probably the most seminal game the club has played because, you know, you're, you are now mm-hmm. in your third season at Knotts. Unfortunately, yeah. it's the third season of National League football. That was yeah. the 90 minutes, wasn't it? That yeah. you, the others go back as all conquering heroes, are promoted the yeah. first time straight back. Great. Keys, yeah. freedom of the city. Right, Gaffer, I'll extension of my contract now. And all, all of that. All of that. Yeah, yeah. And and the manner in which ultimately not, so as you say, didn't start. And I'll tell you one thing. I've, I don't think I've ever met one Knotts fan, because obviously we're all watching it on the telly. don't think yeah. I've met one Knotts fan who said, we deserve to win that. We were unlucky. No, yeah. No, uh, and the thing is, I don't think we, we were unlucky, you know. They had a game plan. Obviously, we had our game plan. They executed theirs better. Um, we knew we knew with the Harrogate game, you know, they were very high energy. You know, they like the ball in behind. Very similar to how Torquay play. I was going to say, yeah. You could be you describing know, Torquay. You know, just thinking of that, you know, and, and um, they just implemented their game plan better than us on the day. And, and like you say, we tried to get back in the game. I remember when, obviously, the goal goes in, I'm thinking, right, you know, we've got a yeah. chance here. Now this is going to change now. They're going to start panicking, you know, squeaky bum time kind of thing. And they kind of went the other way then. And instead of us going on, on and having the momentum after scoring the goal, it was like they just scored the goal. 
that's what it felt like for me watching, obviously, from the side. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a real disappointment that because, like, we knew if we would have gone straight back up that season, you know, you, you, you're going to be well respected. You'll be a legend at the club. You know, you're bouncing straight back. And uh, it just fell short. And it's, it's just one of them ones that sticks with you. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, it, it does it does hurt, like, and it, it will stay with you for, for the rest of your life. But you've got to move on. And like you say, we've got to try and do what we can this season to get this, this club back in the Football League. You say you cope with disappointment well. Um, yeah. How, how big a hurdle was that collectively for you, for the players, to come back from licking your wounds in the, in that summer? It was tough, like. It was tough. Um, I think just, like, in the manner of how it happened and stuff, and, you know, we didn't give a good account of ourselves as a team. So I think it's harder when that happens than if you just get beat by the better team on the day. Um, if you give a good account of yourself and you lose on penalties or something like that, you know, you can kind of forgive yourself a bit more for the situation. But when we come back, I think we all had a sit down meeting and we just said, look, that's gone now, lads. You can't change it. At the end of the day, what's been is been and, and it'll be like that. So we've got to concentrate and we have to have another good go at, at, the, at the season that year. Like so, And that's what we did. We just put it to the back of our minds. You can't, you can't, re- you can't. Think about it too much. Like I always say in football, don't ever get too high, don't ever get too low. Mm. You know, keep level-headed and keep 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 professional and doing your job. Um, so you're going through the season, mm-hmm. chipping away the results. Um, Knox fans in the National League are ultimately never going to be 100% happy. So some people would be saying, oh, we should be playing a more attacking style of football. It's a bit yeah. of power, whatever. But we're kind of... We're on the cusp of the playoffs all the way through, um, and then and then the, the the change was made, uh, yeah, and and a, a and a, and a very different um, footballing approach and culture comes in. Yeah. So, um, mm-hmm. what what was that like back end of the season from Neil moving on, seven or eight tough games, and then the Renaissance to go into the playoffs? Yeah, I think it's it's always difficult when when you have a managerial change, um, because I think sometimes, you know, players think, right, I've got a chance to get back in the fold here. Other lads are like, well, I've worked so hard to prove to this manager that, you know, I should be starting every week. Then you get a new one come in and you've got to do it all over again. But like you say, it is a new culture at the club. And I think from top to bottom, this is the direction the club want to go in. Um, it's right style of play. It's, it's good football. It's entertaining. And when obviously the gaffer came in, the lads were excited about, you know, the prospect of playing this way and, and, and playing this type of football. You know, no one wants to play for a team that just bangs it back to front and, you know, midfield get missed out. You know, the game of football is to entertain. And I, I believe personally, I know that, well, the, all the lads do have bought into this philosophy of high press, high energy, uh, move the ball quick, forward running, forward passing. And, you know, when the gaffer came in, there was a slight transition mm. where, obviously, we had a bit of bad results and stuff like that. But that's, that's to be expected when you, when you change your manager and they're trying to come in. We had game after game after game. We couldn't really work on much um, on the training ground. But what we could see when we were on the training ground is the sessions that the gaffer brought and, and what he wanted to achieve and the route he wanted to go down was an enjoyable one. You know, lads bought into it straight away. The set training sessions are great. You know, they're always like you were down there the other day. You know, obviously we did a MB11 when you were there yesterday. Yeah. But if you'd come to a normal day of training, you know, we're doing multiple things that the lads are enjoying. And I think it's important that lads buy into that philosophy. You know, because I don't think I think if you're signing players, you they've got to know straight away that look, this is the way we want to play. If it doesn't suit you or you're not wanting to buy into it, then you're not for me kind of thing. So, uh, but yeah, there was a transition period, but I think you can see as it's gone on over, say, the last, what is it now? The gaff has been in charge for now eight, 14 months, 15 months or something like that. Yeah. We're gradually getting better. I, and things are starting to become natural now rather than lads are thinking it. You know, the, the phases of play we do, we work on all the time. They're coming naturally to the lads. People know where people are going to be. So I think a bit of patience sometimes, because obviously as fans, 
everyone's entitled to their opinion. You know, us as footballers, we play a sport where you're going to be criticised. You know, you're going to have to answer to fans and stuff eventually because they pay the money and they come down and it's their team. But patience sometimes in football is rewarded. And I think if we is if we are patient and you know we work hard at what we're doing, I believe it'll get us to where we need to go. You talk about the change in culture. Um, yeah. And I guess it's very easy to typecast people, isn't it? So you're yeah. six two, six three, strong, yeah. powerful centre half. And I think you mentioned earlier in this interview, Neil Aspin, edit, kick it, etc. Yeah. yeah. Clearly. Ian wants more more to your game than that mm-hmm. which previous managers might have just said, Connell. Uh, yeah. 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 How that are you stiff, finding yeah. that? I'm quite well, I'm enjoying it. Um since the gaffer came in, you know, my game with the ball, you know, if you'd like to say it, is is come on leaps and bounds, I believe. Um, but that's just because we work meticulously on it every day. You know, we do passing drills every day. And, you know, some sometimes some players look at a passing drill as like a secondary warm-up or, you know, or just go through the motions and all this, where when I'm doing it, I make sure that I do everything right. Like if it was match speed, match pace. Um, and I've enjoyed working on that side of the game um, under the gaffer. You know, uh, still got a long way to go. You know, I'm still working hard on on, on what, wants, what needs to be done to play out from the back. And every day is a learning day. But like you say, I think defensively, I'm. You know what you're going to get at me defensively. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll head a ball, I'll, I'll tackle, I'll organise, I'll scream, I'll shout. You know, you're never going to take that away from me because that is my game. Um, but like you say, it's enjoyable to be able to work on, on something that you're not good at because that's the philosophy of what we're trying to achieve. And like you say, I, I believe I'm, I'm. Okay with the ball, I'm decent, a yeah. good standard. Um, but I always want to get better. I'm always trying to get better. I'm always practicing and training and taking it seriously. It needs to be done properly if you want to improve. And like you say, I'm in, I'm enjoying my time here. But, but I guess you you obviously played the game for many years. I've been around yeah. around it for many years. You and I would both know that whatever you think you can do, fundamentally yeah. you you do what the manager tells you, don't you? And play in a certain yeah. way. Otherwise, you're not in the team very long. So so presumably, Ian's instructions mm-hmm. of what he wants from you are probably mm-hmm. quite a bit different than from several of your previous managers. Yeah, yeah. But that's because his philosophy is different. Yes, exactly. And, uh, yeah. you know, and, and it's nice to actually be trusted mm-hmm. to play this way. You know, he gives us a lot, lot of uh, credit and stuff. You know, we do a lot of video stuff. We're... we're we're really critical on each other behind closed doors, which I think is really good. I think it's important to not concentrate on what you do well, but concentrate on what you don't do so well, because that's the only way you're going to get better. Um, and like you say, you know, the gaffer is employed this philosophy and, and it's enjoyable to play this way. Do you know what I mean? No one wants to take a ball swap for a goal kick and just run up to the halfway line every time, boot it. It gets booted back over my head. I'm running back the other way. It's nice to have a bit of football and when you make a good pass or, you know, you, you drive through, you step in, you know, you, 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 you know, oh, it's good that, yeah. It's good. So it's a bit of swag about it, do you know what I mean? So it's, um, it's really enjoyable, like you say, and I think the lads that we've got at the club have really bought into that kind of idea of playing like how Man City play with like a Liverpool press. That's how I, that's how I see our style. You know, not obviously at that level because they are the two best teams in the world. But I think what we're trying to implement is like the passing style of City and the pressing side of Liverpool. You know, Liverpool, quick regains. They get the ball back early. They press you high up the pitch. And I think that's what we're trying to do without the ball. And with the ball, obviously, we're trying to play like City. Hey, what, what a good quote that is, Connor. Uh, <laughs> our, our mutual friend, Lee Curtis, who listens to all these and does yeah, quite a yeah. few stories off the back of them. I guarantee you, you'll be reading that in the post in a few days' time. OK? <laughs> I guarantee you. <laughs> Play like City, press like Liverpool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good line. Um, before we talk a little bit more about this season, let's just get the other playoff out of the way. Uh, yeah. Playoffs, playoff campaigns in Ewan Notts County have not exactly been fantastic, have they, on a variety of fronts? No. Um, no. Yeah. So let's go back to last season. There's 15, yeah. 15 under of us allowed back in. 
um, and it's Chesterfield. And you are starting this time, so that's good. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I was brilliant that as well to, to to play in front of a crowd that big. And like I say, after the lockdown and no crowds, it was brilliant that was, yeah. yeah. I've got to say, it was a bit Looney Tunes at time, that game, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, it was. <laughs> well, it was good for the neutral, put it that way. Um, so... Oh! Sorry. Uh, oh, cool. there we go. Back, yeah. back. I part that. No, no, no worries. So, so, so good for the neutral... Um, yeah. Now I think you. I don't want to remind you of it, but I think you came off at half time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but we've won. That. Yeah. That's yeah. the bottom line. So yeah. now we're off to che uh, Torquay. Yeah. Um. So again, having come off at half time, were you con were you fearing the worst or not? What 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 was your mindset going going to Torquay? Yeah, I think, like you say, I said before, you do get an inkling, you know, you feel you feel when you're playing, you know when you're going to be playing. And when you're not, you kind of know as well. Like, I just remember going up there and obviously it was disappointing to come off at half time, but it was just one of them things where, you know, you push yourself down and you're like, right, lad, let's go and win the game. You know, forget about any individual praise or any individual uh, disappointments um, and just do it as a team. And obviously we went up to Hockey and I, and I didn't play in the semis. Um but at the time, you know, uh, Mark Ellis was playing brilliantly. Do you know what I mean? He was Mark, scoring yeah. goals. He was playing really well. And sometimes, as a footballer, you, you know, you just cut all your hands up and say, oh, "He's playing better than me at the minute." It's just that's just the way it goes. And and uh, he ended up obviously playing it in the centre of the three. Um, and like you say, just a bit of disappointment again not to play. But I'm more disappointed about losing, not about not playing. If you get me. Do you know what I mean? Because again, last season, you know, I think I played 40 games again. I was going to say, uh, yeah. Yeah, another 40 games. 43 uh, games, 3,669 minutes. Yeah, so another good, solid season for myself. Um, but just losing was more disappointing than, than not playing. You know, I, I hate losing, um, especially to Torquay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but yeah, but um, yeah, like I said, it was disappointment but you, you move on you know you push yourself down and you crack on you know I mean uh, sadly quite a lot of us have had a uh, exper bad experiences of a bad journey coming back from Torquay fairly recently as in a week yeah. um, t t tell us what it is like so you've got beat in extra time at Torquay yeah um, you've then got four five hour co coach ride back up yeah. to Nottingham What's yeah. that like? Does everybody sit in silence as the gaffer peeled the west the dressing room walls down? Are the videos being shown on the bus? Mm. What, 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 what happens? Well, I think obviously the mood isn't great. Um, <laughs> I'll be honest, but you get on and you know I sit at the back of the bus. You know me, Carl Wotton, Jim O'Brien, Lacey, Chickson, Sam Slocum. We do an awful lot on the way home talk about games. You know, we go over the games, we talk about it, what we could have done better, what we could have done here, you know, performance-wise and stuff like this. And, you know, when you when you lose against Torquay in the, in the semi-final and you're coming back and it's like, could have done this, could have done that. And it's, it's hard to let it go, but it's important in football not to, like, get too down. You, you've got to be, because there's always going to be a next game, there's always a next season. If you let it dwell too often, then it just carries on into the next season. So you've got to, you know, be disappointed, you know, but you've got to learn to move on quickly from it. Interesting what you said about the team bus. I remember my yeah. time at Leicester. Um, do, do, do you all have the same seats every game? Is it the old superstition yeah. thing, the, the yeah. card score, yeah. whatever? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, everyone's got their seat, like, yeah. yeah. So who's at the front of the bus? Who's nearest the gaffer? Um, there's a... Table behind the gaffers with, I think it's got Vion, Viton, Ed, Francis, uh, Matty Palmer's on it. Uh, I think Jaden's on it as well, a bit further down the bus. And you come back to the, say, the middle of the bus, and you've got Dion, Cam, Ruben, people like that in the middle of the thing. And then you get to the back. It's like it must be an age thing. Yeah. Because all the oldies are at the back. <laughs> But um, but yeah, like you said, I I enjoy the away games, mate. I enjoy the banter with the lads. It's it's something 
for me, like when obviously I angle my boots that I'll miss the most is the environment that you're in every day and, and stuff like that. Like we spoke the other day, I said, you can come into training and be in the worst mood ever. Something really bad had happened. And within five minutes, you're laughing. You know, you're joking around. Someone's picking you up. They can see you're a bit down. Someone crack a joke and you're smiling again. Then. Um, Centre-halves. Mm -hmm. I was once told you cannot be a proper centre-half until you've had uh, a broken nose or two uh, <laughs> and a, lo a lot of scar tissue, a lot of stitches. Yeah. And I think quite coincidentally, you said with your good lady, you'd actually been counting up all your stitches recently. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, I came home after the Torquay game and she'd sucked them in. She went, oh, not again. Uh, so, uh, it, yeah, it's a quite a regular occurrence for obviously myself. And we counted up 34 stitches that I've had in my face over the years um, playing. So, uh, yeah, I've had a fair few whacks. <laughs> Yes, because you, you had the bandage on, didn't you? Because it looked, from what I can see, a bit of a jagged yeah. one just above the eyebrow, yeah? Yeah, it's just just on the inside, uh, above the inside of my eyebrow, yeah. Um, yeah, it's the first one, like I said, it's, it looks like I've got a Harry Potter on me for it. Like, <laughs> it's like a lightning bolt. But uh, I, I took the stitches out myself yesterday and it, it looks like it's healing okay and stuff. And they've done a really good job. The people down at Torquay, you know, done a really good job in that. So, with it, so. when you've taken some of these bangs um, <laughs> is it normally the club doctor that stitches you up in the dressing room or have you had to be carted off to A&E at various times well normally you, you at every game you'll have a club doctor there I think it's part and parcel of one of the requirements for a match day um, so nine times out of ten all doctors know how to stitch yeah so uh, yeah like you say I've had uh, I had one on my forehead here when I was at Port Vale a bad one like uh, but I was lucky the club doctor at Port Vale was a uh, plastic surgeon, facial. So he'd done a really good job with that one, like, and you can hardly see it now. So, uh, but yeah, I've, I've had a few over the years, you know, I had 12 under my eye here, seven in my forehead, six there the other day, two each side of here, my chin, my lip, everywhere. So, uh, so yeah, it's good I've got this big beard to cover up a few of them. <laughs> uh, and nose? Cracked my nose once, I've still got a bit of a dent in it. Um, yeah. didn't, do, didn't have a fully break, so uh, fingers, my touch wood, uh, that doesn't go anytime soon. <laughs> hey, ab ab absolutely. Um, okay, let's have, let's have a couple of um thoughts from you, a bit, bit of light hearted. Um, 50 50 tackle, yeah, on the training ground, yeah, you and Dion, yeah. Who comes away with a ball nine times out of ten? Or is it a 50-50 shot? D on that every time, every day. <laughs> he's uh, he's pound for pound the toughest lad I know. Fact. Yeah. yeah, he is an animal. Yeah, he trains like an animal. You know, he plays like an animal. I love that. I love that about him. Like, you know, I could take anyone that trenches with me in that team, it'd be him. Without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a good lad as well off the pitch. Really good lad. Because I saw um, when we were watching the training, he left I, a bit on. Was, was it Cal or was it Jade? And it might have been both. But I remember Dion yeah, going yeah. in, and I just saw yeah. I just saw the metal studs <laughs> just over the top of the toes. <laughs> yeah, the no, the I, I could, on the floor. I could see. I looked over, and I could see you giggling. Like I think Jaden <laughs> let out a yelp as well, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he looked at Dion. So like, what are you doing? But that's Dion. Do you know what I mean? Like he, you know, he catches me over a week in training, coming into a tackle. And he's like, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to catch you. And all that. I said, don't have to apologise for me, mate. That, that's part of your game. I would never want to try and take it out of you. Do you know what I mean? So I think, you know, and it's important to have players like that, do you know what I mean, that can rile the, the uh, opposition. You know, every single week when Dion plays, he's in someone's face. You know, and I think it's important to have that within your side. It, it'd have been great when he up against Savage. Oh, yeah, that yeah. Last, last night, them closing minutes of that game. Christ, oh, it'd no, have been yeah. perfect athletic. Oh, it'd, have, it'd have been right in the mix of there, like. <laughs> um, okay, um, this season. Mm -hmm. So we're doing this interview with six games to go. Um, yeah. How would you describe, assess this season? Has anything surprised you? What, what What's your take on it so far? Um... I think we've been a little bit inconsistent. Um, but I think that comes down to the fact that, you know, we've had periods in this season where we've had 
a lot of injuries to key positions with players. Um, you know, I go back to, I think, maybe October time, you know, when we lost to Halifax, Woking, you know, on a, uh, a draw away to Altrincham. But, you know, you're losing your three centre-backs. You know, you've Cammy was out, I was out, Lacey was out. And it's kind of hard to maintain results when you when you lose into your early entire back three, more or less, if you want to say that. Um, later on, we've had a bit of another tough patch, but we had a lot of illness within the camp, mm -hmm. some more injuries. So I don't think this is this has helped us to keep anything consistent. But you know, for me, you're looking at the playoffs every year minimum for this club. There's not a chance uh, uh, you you know you ever want to miss them playoffs. If you miss the playoffs, if they're not scout, you know, you, you class the season as a disaster. So for us lads, we know that that's the bare minimum. So and then you give yourself a shot then of promotion through the playoffs. Um, the start of every season, we're always going for the league. You're always going to win it. But with there only being one automatic spot in this division, it's whoever can put that ten wins together in a row. Do you know what I mean? I think you've done it. You know, uh, Barrow had a good run when they won it that year. Um, last season, you know, I thought Hartlepool was strong, but Sutton obviously went on to win it, didn't they? Yeah. Um, but yeah, like Sutton did the same, went on a good run of games. You put five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten games of wins together and all of a sudden you pull away and then you're not looking behind you as often as you would be if you were drawing one and winning one. But Stockport have run away with it a little bit this year. Um, that surprised you or not? Yeah, it has really because I think when we've always played Stockport, other than obviously getting beat 3-0 there when we had a lot of illness inside and we couldn't really compete, we've been very dominant and strong against that that side. And I never looked at them and thought, like, they're going to be the team to beat. You know, it wasn't like that. Um, but they've got a great manager. He knows how to win at this level. Yeah. Um, and he's shown with Hartlepool. You know, he did well at Fylde as well, challenging us. So, you know, that is still what means that sometimes that's what happens. Your team goes on a good run. Before you know it, you're thinking, oh, they're miles ahead here. You know, let's just concentrate on us and, and get as many points on the board and get in the playoffs, which is which is what we've been doing. You know, obviously, it was a horror show on Saturday, uh, Saturday against Torquay. Um, we, I spoke with this about you the other day at training. You know, I, I said I felt embarrassed. Um, to have delivered a performance like that for the fans that came down. You know, it was really tough. But we've got to move on from that quickly and we've got a huge game, obviously, against Kings Lynn coming up. So, uh, you know, we've just got to make sure we finish as high as possibly can in the playoffs and we give ourselves a shot then going into the end of the season. Um, as a proud Welshman, uh, someone mm -hmm. who was born in Wrexham, yeah. what do you make of what's going on there? Well, it's it's one of them. I think uh, for me, I think Wrexham have have earned that takeover for me because they've spent so many years with such a big club in non-league. They yeah. fought their way. They've been very unlucky. The fans have stayed very very loyal to them. Um, you know, it is the the cornerstone of the community that that club in Wrexham. It really is. And for me, I think good on them. Do you know what I mean? As a, this is me looking as a fan. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, I think you know good on them they're having a bit of success now you know they've got the backing that they need but I think you know you've seen it before in this league throwing money at it doesn't always work no. do you know what I mean you like look at Sutton and Barrow the last two champions of this division didn't have huge budgets didn't throw loads of money at it it's about getting the right team the right mentality and uh, if all that clicks together then that's what gets you up there so it'll be interesting to see how uh, how everything pans out coming the end of the season really um if, if you try and draw, um, not crumbs of comfort, but if you think, you know, how can Torquay may end up making our season better uh, mm -hmm. come, the, come the final game? The, the manager spoke, didn't he, about not wanting to forget it, but yeah. to remember yeah. it. Um, yeah. He did make mention that perhaps a little bit of complacency, or not, as the case may be. Um, yeah. Um, you said you felt embarrassed by it. Um, yeah. Is this kind of something you, you, you detect collectively among the players? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, 
yeah, it wasn't pleasant coming home. It was a long drive home and you have a lot of time to reflect on, on what's happened and think about it and stuff. And, you know, it, it's collectively, like the gaffer said, it's very important to not forget how them moments feel. You've got to get past them and get over them and forget about it. But you can't forget how it made you feel because you, you can use that then going into future games. You know, I don't want to feel that disappointment again. I don't want to feel that embarrassment to, to have that happen to us again. And you use it and you kind of turn a negative into a positive by doing that. So I think, you know, personally, I keep stuff like that with me. You might, I might not show it, but I always keep it in me because I can use that type of stuff to motivate myself to say, right, this ain't going to happen again. You know, and I'd like to think the rest of the lads will, will do the same. You know, we've got a good, honest bunch of lads there. Yeah. I, I think in, you were down at training the other day. And I think you can see the, the eagerness to do well and the commitment to the club that they all have. So I think uh, we've just got to all come together as fan base and as a club and really go into the playoffs as best we can. And, and I'm really hoping, because when I first signed here, I said, if I ever leave this club and I haven't got the club or been part of getting the club back promoted to the EFL, then I'd feel like I'd failed at this club, regardless of how many games I played, regardless of how well I did personally. I'd still feel like it was unfinished business for me. That's another League Curtis exclusive. About a week on Tuesday, Leo dropped that one. Um, <laughs> as fans, um, you know, we study the fixtures, you know, and there has been some debate about home form versus away record. Um, yeah. Um, and the way the playoffs are weighted, you know, uh, third and fourth one less playoff game means you're at home. And so we're all yeah. working computation. Oh, we've really got to finish third. We, 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 can't, we can't finish lower than fifth. Um, yeah. what, 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 as players, how yeah. do you approach all this? Because I think my Kevin Nicholson, former Torquay manager and Knott's player, and he said, to be honest, he said, I, I wouldn't be worried about scraping through in seventh because no one gives you a chance then. I mean, wh 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 yeah. where are you with all of this debate that, that we as fans have constantly? Yeah, yeah for, for me, I think it's just about finishing as high as you possibly can. You know, we're not going to go, oh, we'll finish seventh, so we go under the radar. <laughs> because, yeah, please you know, don't yeah. think that. Yeah, please. yeah, yeah. We, 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 we're... Uh, we want to finish high, and like you say, I think the the advantages of finishing second and third are huge because you get one game at home and then you're in the final if you're winning. You know, I think when you look at it, when you finish outside the top three, um, you kind of know it's a long, drawn-out process. It's going to be a lot tougher. So I think the aim for us is to, to try and just chase down that third spot as best we can. Um, keep working. We've got you know, I think seven, six, seven games left now. Um, easily capable of going on and winning every one. Do you know what I mean? We are capable and I, I do honestly believe we could do that. Um, but football is football. You never know what can happen. Um, but I think what happened at Torquay the other day is going to trigger us now into thinking, right, you know, let's get ourselves into gear here now. That's not happening again now. You know, nothing, nothing's guaranteed at this moment. We need to finish as high as we possibly can. And we need to get a home draw, really, in the playoffs. Um, th 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 those that watch watch our shows know that I yeah. have this I have this big bugbear um, about when people say playoffs are a lottery and all of that, you know. Yeah. And, and I, you know, and I would say, well, it's no coincidence that Dave Challoner won the playoffs last year with Hartlepool, uh, hmm. and now he's doing very well at Stockport. And if you said yeah. to Neil Warnock, for instance, a legendary ex knots manager with something like about ninety yeah. percent winning record of playoffs from about six of them, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and you said to them it's a lottery, it's all down to luck, you know, it, I, I suspect you'd take, take a very dim view of it. Clearly, you need some luck. Um, yeah, as as because let's be honest, Stockport. I don't think we're going to catch Stockport now. Um, so, no. so it is playoffs for us this season, realistically, assuming we do our business in the last six yeah. or seven games. Yeah. How as players do you approach playoffs? Um, I think I say it, it, it differs between different people. People have different emotions, people, different personalities. For me personally, it's just about staying calm. It's just another game. You know, you don't like to... There's, there's pressure there. When you play big games, you know, like the Chesterfield game, for instance, the other week, yeah. there's a different energy in the changing rooms. 
it's you know it's a big game. You know there's pressure on it. You know the expectation there. And I always say you've got to use that and turn that into a good performance because it is, you know, you, you we're such a, you know, the sport we're in is so driven by performance and it's so pressurised. You've got to be on it every day, every day, every day. And sometimes people will slip up because you're only human and they will have a bad game. But I think it's being able to control the pressure yourself and the nerves to manifest a good performance. So for me, I, I quite enjoy the big occasions, the big games, the BT games, because I like that feeling. I like that nervous feeling you get before the game. You know, your legs might be a little bit jelly and that, and you, you know you're going into it. I kind of love love that feeling of pressure. Um, so for me, you know, I'm just hoping that we, like you say, we do the business between now and then, and then we get we get a crack at the playoffs. And like you say, you said then you do need a little bit of luck. Yeah, absolutely. But the thing is with with the playoffs, you, if you don't turn up, that's it, you're done. Yeah. There's no next week. Do you know what I mean? There's nothing to put it right. And like you say, two good games on the bounce is easier than having three good games on the bounce. So that top two, the two, two second and third place, you know, is, is something we've got to really go for, like it's actual promotion. You know, we've got to really go for that because it'll give us a, an advantage come the end of the season. Connell, it's been a pleasure listening to you. Um, yeah. I'm sure everyone will enjoy listening to all of this. Thank you ever so much indeed. Thank you for taking the time out. Um, no, I know, I, I just, uh, you, you, you're, you're relaxing a bit now, I can see. Uh, beds near, nearby, because one thing I did notice from the training session, um, I, I knew clearly it would be very technical, um, but the intensity uh, oh, yeah. and the speed at which it is, you know, yeah, every yeah. year football speeds up a bit, doesn't it? You know, yeah. and... At national league level, let alone League Two, League One, mm. Championship, you know, what, what struck me in the week was the sheer speed and intensity of the whole session, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it trains like that every day, every day. The lads really buy into it, they work hard, you know. The game of the day is 100 mile an hour, lads, are like you say, Dion's going into tackles, lads are doing it properly because you need to do that because on a Saturday, you know. There's not only a couple of players on the planet that can just turn it on like that. You need to do day in, day out what you do on a Saturday to be ready when the game comes round. And, you know, training's really enjoyable because sometimes training at other clubs I've been at, it can get a bit monotonous, you know what I mean? It's how like, oh, training's it. Lads are buzzing to go into training all the time here. Do you know what I mean? We, we have high competitive games and training all the time. So, uh like you say, it does surprise people. You weren't the first one to say it because you've had a few sponsors down for it previously. And they said they were shocked at the speed and intensity that you train at. Um, but it, that's, you, you've got to work hard. That's a bare minimum um, for me in training. Connell, thank you very much indeed for your time. Um, yeah. We, we, we will gladly take... Now, you, you, you have done 27 consecutive victories. So uh, if we're counting up at the time of doing this, there's six or seven left, uh, two or three in the playoffs. Nine's easy when you've done 27 straight, isn't it? Yeah, well, you like to think so. <laughs> oh, no, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thanks for having me, mate. Bye-bye.